It has been about 22 months since uh, Newhart went on a missions trip, and we uh, just came back two days ago after 22 months of, uh, I guess, silence. Uh, we had a chance to go to uh, all the way to Philippines. I've literally been to uh, so many places in the world, but this place is the ends of the earth. It takes about 36 hours to get there. Okay? You probably don't uh, sense what that feels like. We left on Monday night here, okay, uh, taking Korean Air, a uh, 12.50 uh, flight to Seoul. So we left home around 9 o'clock. And I called Sua, church office uh, secretary, on Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock in the morning here. And we were still traveling, okay? We started on Monday night. All the way to like Monday afternoon, a uh, Monday noon time, to arrive uh, to final destination. You you ought to try it. Okay, this is an something that cannot be described. Just constantly traveling on the move for 36 hours. Uh, but that's that's nothing. Okay, uh, I don't know whether you noticed three uh, sisters and a brother gave testimonies and. I think the common thing you probably hear is that, is that after they coming back from this missions trip, they began to think about church. Have you noticed? Because church uh, and mission is really one. It really is one. If you love the church, you will love missions. If you love missionary heart, uh, you will love the church. I think that's how it works. Some time ago, I noticed that every time I go away and see uh, the work of the Lord and the greatness of God, uh, something that Lord places deeper and deeper within my heart is that I want to go back and build this church. Okay? So it is very important to know that church and mission is not two separate things or something that you do on the side. So we set aside maybe 10% of the budget, budget of the church for the missions. It's not like that at all. Church exists for missions. And mission is to bring church where there's no church. Okay? That's how it works. So I just want to praise the Lord and all that He has done. And so many people say, I can't hear, we, uh, you know, until I hear what happened there. And my answer to that is, there is no way to tell you by words. Okay? And it is not to just kind of like, you know, um, say, uh, but I, I say this because it is true. It is, it, there is no way for you to describe what really God has been, God is doing and the greatness of God with human mere words. I don't think it's possible. Okay? Uh, I'm hoping that starting next year, uh, we would uh, really develop a missions program for youth group uh, students as well as for the uh, older group of people too, locally as well as uh, perhaps in Europe. I don't know, uh, wherever God opens the door. But I just pray that you would have a desire to, you know, experience mission and really to experience uh, the heart of God. Okay, can we just give it up to the Lord uh, for Philippines mission, what he has done? Yeah. I want to continue uh, with a series of redeeming heart, which is what Christianity is. Christianity deals with your heart, okay? Not your, uh, you know, outward things, but it deals with your heart, okay? Today, uh, for next three sessions, I want to talk about heart of Christ, okay? Could you look at the title, Heart of Christ, okay? Does he have one? What is in the heart of Christ? Is there such thing? Okay. What is in his heart? What is his greatest, deepest concern for Christ? Okay. Is there such thing? And my answer is absolutely. Right? John chapter 17, uh, today's text, is what is known as the high priestly prayer of Jesus. Okay. Jesus actually prayed all the time but this is the prayer written and this has been written just few hours before his death 
okay, before the cross. If you think about it, could that be not important? If he prayed for something, is that, did he pray for something that is not possible? Absolutely not, right? There is something that is very important to Christ and to the heart of Christ, okay? So what did he pray for at such a critical hour? Okay. What really mattered to him? What was, in the, what, what was his greatest and deepest concern uh, in, in his life? It had to be what was in the heart and heart of Christ. Okay? If I may give you the structure, which is made up of 26 verses, uh, this chapter deals with three major topics. If you could just pay attention. One has to do with praying for himself. Okay? Sounds selfish, but... Let me explain that, okay? Second has to do with praying for his disciples, okay? And third, he is praying for all believers, which means the church. So himself, Christ himself, disciples, and the church, okay? And the word for himself is glorify, okay? That's the key word. And word for his disciple is to sanctify, Okay? And word for the all believers in the church is to unify. Okay? That's what he prayed for. Glorify, sanctify, and unify. Okay? So here's the first section, verses 1 through 5, where he prays for himself. Let me read this uh, one more time. Okay? John chapter 17 is after John chapter 14 through 16, what is known as the Olivet Discourse which is the last teaching of Jesus right before he died, major teaching, and then his prayer. John chapter 17 is the prayer, okay? And here is the prayer. When Jesus has spoken these words, okay, I'll live at this course, he lift up, lifted up his eyes to heaven like this, oops, okay, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. Here's the word, glorify. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him, and this is the eternal life. Listen to this. This is what it means to have eternal life. See if you have eternal life, okay? Because it defines it. Actually, Jesus defines it. This is eternal life. That they may know you, the one only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Okay? I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the work that you have gave me, gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Okay? If you look at it, first five verses, the word glorify repeats, right? So what was his prayer for himself? Father, the hour has come. And glorify your son. That was his prayer. And you may be thinking, oh, that's so selfish. He's praying for himself. Glorify your son. But it is not what you are hearing. It may sound like a selfish prayer at glance, but it isn't. Because it, 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 claimed, uh, it implies that Jesus is deity. There's no one else who could be glorified other than God. Okay? He's basically saying, glorify your son so that Son may glorify you. That's his prayer. Do you hear what he's praying? And I think the key thing is the hour has come. In John's gospel, the hour has to do with the cross all the time. Okay? And in this critical hour, Jesus is praying, praying that he, would he will be glorified. Okay? Here's the eternal plan of God. Okay, let me explain the eternal plan of God. The eternal plan of God is to glorify His Son, okay? Eternal plan of God. Before you were born, before the foundation of the world, eternal plan of God is to glorify His Son by God sending Him into the world so that He may do the atoning work through the cross and through which He purchases His people and the people, becomes, people become His bride. That was the eternal plan of God. And we need to know this. Because it's not really about you. It is about Him. That's the eternal plan of God. 
In other words, his people will be given eternal life. And here's the definition. This is the eternal life. That you know God the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Do you know him? Okay. Knowing the only true God, and he sent his son. What does that mean? He sent his son for a purpose. And hopefully that purpose has deep relationship with you. That's what it means to have eternal life. Okay? That's how Jesus defines it. Right? So, this was to be done by son's obedience to come into the world to death by his uh, you know, obedience and through resurrection which will abolish sin and death. Okay? And the redeemed, those that Father has given, will become his bride. And that's the eternal plan of God. The church is the bride of God. And God has given you, those of you who believe in one and only true God, and son he has sent, becomes the church, the bride. And through that, God, Christ may get glorified. Okay? Glorify. Okay? If you look at, uh, if you think about it, what is Jesus praying? He's right before his death, Lord, glorify me. In other words, Lord, would you help me to carry out the cross that I may be obedient unto you so that through which you will be glorified. That's his concern. Okay, that's his concern. And I'm just asking you, is that your concern? That you will carry out your life to obedience so that God may be glorified, okay? I think that was his, his concern in the heart of Christ. I show this uh, slide that I made a couple weeks ago. This is not Philippines Ocean. I got this from Google, okay? I don't know where this is, but uh, I think it gives you the picture. And the verse is from Habakkuk chapter 2. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, okay? I need, I need to speak this to you again and again and again because you forget. As the waters cover the sea, okay? How many gallons? Is that compatible to waterfall? No way, right? Can you imagine Pacific Ocean or Indian Ocean or Mediterranean? Can you imagine the size and the volume and the depth and the Bible's picture is that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will fill the earth. In other words, nothing will matter at the end. It's going to be the glory of God. You need to understand this. That's what Jesus prayed. That's what Jesus prayed. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. That was his first prayer. Okay? Second prayer is uh, John uh, chapter 17, 6 through 19. It has to do with sanctify the disciples, okay? I want to explain what that means, but to get there, who are the disciples? Here are some dis descriptions of the disciples of Jesus. I have manifested your name to the people, the disciples, okay? Whom you gave me. Disciples are the people that Father has given the Son, okay? It's His. It belongs to Christ, okay? And out of the world, out of the world, not living for the world, but out of the world, taken out of the world, yours, God's, but they were, but they were given to me, and they have kept your word. So what makes, uh, what makes people disciples? They belong to the Father, given to Christ, taken out of the world, and they heard the word, and they believed. Are you a disciple of Christ? Okay. Something you need to, you must pay attention to. One more description. They were not of the world, just as I am not of the world. You know, coming back uh, from uh, Southeast Asia, which is really, really far. Africa takes about 20 hours, but Philippines takes about 36 hours, 16 more hours to just to get there, right? So in my mind, it feels like the ends of the earth. If there is any, any place is the, end, uh, the ends of the earth, that place we went to is like the ends of the earth. There is no Wi-Fi, there is no phone connection, there's nothing basically, 
in the middle of, the, middle of one of the islands. And, but I, but I want to just tell you, okay, at the end of the day, it's going to be the glory of God. Until you settle with that, you're not going to live this life properly. Okay? Those disciples that Father has given to Christ, you hear the word and you believe and you listen to them. Do you listen to the word? I must, you, I must ask this question. Do you listen to the word? Does it matter to you? Right? They're not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. And here's the three verses that I want to explain. Sanctify them, the disciples, if you are the disciples of Christ. Sanctify them by the truth. And your word is the truth. Why do you need to be sanctified? So that as you have sent me, Father has sent me into the world, and I have sent them into the world. It is so interesting, isn't it? They were taken out of the world, but sent back into the world. But before that happens, you need to be sanctified. Okay? What does sanctification mean? Can you, can you look at me? Don't, I woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning. Okay? Stay with me, please. I'm just completely you know, just going with caffeine right now. Okay? So stay with me. Right? What's sanctification? Jesus prayed that you would be sanctified. In other words, you will not drift into all kinds of the leading of the world. That you will not waste your life but you'll be sanctified, that you will live for the purpose of God. Wouldn't that, if everything is about the glory of God, if you don't live for it, what is your life? Think about it, brothers and sisters. If there is God, and all that matters is the purpose of, purpose of God at the end, if you are not living for the purpose of God, what is your life? Bible basically calls it's nothing. If you live like that. But sanctification, sanctify them, means setting them apart for the purpose of God. And how does that happen? By the truth. And your word is the truth. Okay? Now, I want to explain something. It doesn't say your word is true. It doesn't say that. It's not an adjective here, but it is a noun. Which means it is not just true thing, but it is the truth. In other words, everything else, every ideology, every faith, every value system must be tested with the Word of God. Otherwise, it is not true. That's what it means. It, em it embodies okay, the truth itself. It is the standard of truth against which everything else must be tested and compared to. Can I just ask you, your value system, whatever the things that you are pursuing after, is it? In, in, in sync with the teaching of the word or not? I think that's what you need to pay attention to. Jesus pray that sanctify these people by the truth. Your word is the truth. Is the word of God matter to you? If not, what are you going by? Right? Are you a disciple of Christ? If you're not following Christ, what are you following? Because we are all following something. Okay? If you are not following Christ, what are you following? So many times I hear this kind of value system, right? Or that kind of value system. Or this kind of value system I learned, I read. It must be tested with the Word of God because the Word of God is the truth. If you believe this, would you say amen? people of God. This is what Jesus prayed at the end. Is marriage has the upper hand over Christ? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. John Piper talks about it, right? Marriage is not even the second thing. Marriage is not even uh, a third thing. It's infinitely less important than God himself. That's the teaching of the Word of God. Okay? Does that mean we just kind of like, kind of like, uh, do whatever with our marriage? Absolutely not. It's very, very important. But the point is, you need to put things into perspective that if God is God, He is infinitely more important. So much more important. Right? Sanctify them. 
so that they may be sent into the world. Not to survive hiding, right? Not to just live just like the rest of the world. Sanctify them by your truth so that they'll be sent into the world as salt and light. Isn't that what Jesus is praying for? Right? Jesus is clearly praying that, sanctify them so that, we, so that I may send them into the world. You're not of the world, but you're sent into the world. What a tremendous, tremendous, right, identity and confidence you could have because I'm sent by the living God, the glory of living God, sent into the world, right? And here's one more thing I want to explain. Just to sanctify you, this is what Jesus did. For their sake, the disciples of Christ, I consecrated myself. Who's I here? Jesus. What does that mean? He's consecrated. He's basically talking about the cross. You know, you know why we need to be sanctified? Because he died for us. And we are called to live a life that is worthy of his price. That's what Jesus is praying for. I died for you so that you may live a life of sanctification. Okay? I hope you hear the word, brothers and sisters. Okay? I hope you hear the world. Okay? For their sake, I consecrated myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. Okay? Second, sanctify. Okay? I want to quote uh, Oswald Chambers. If you could just look at this. Sanctification is not something... Our Lord does in me, sanctification is Christ in me, okay? It's Christ in me. It's, he's everything. It's my all in all. That's what sanctification is. If that happens, you will live for Him. Otherwise, you live for yourself. That's just the way it is, okay? Secondly, Oswald Chamber also says, are we prepared to, uh, for what sanctification will do? It'll cost an intense narrowing of all our interests on earth and an immeasurable, immense broadening of our interest in God. Okay? I ask you to think about whether sanctification is happening in your life. As you're getting older, are you getting more and more interested in the world? Traveling? This or that? Right? Or is it become less and less and less and he becomes greater and greater, greater interest. That's a sign of sanctification. As you're growing older, as you're having kids, as you uh, just bought a house, as you just got a degree, where, wherever you may be in your life, is your life getting more and more interested in the world? There's more things to explore and learn about. Or is it getting less and less and less? And it becomes everything that I want to know. Okay? You should test whether your life is being sanctified or not. And I, can I just ask you, is it okay not to be sanctified as, in, in your age? I think it's absolutely it is important. Because you know why? You go on like this in your 20s and your 30s. Before you know it, know it your heart will be so sclerocardia, sclerosis. It's going to get so hardened, so hardened. Only the Spirit of God and the truth could melt your heart so that you could be sanctified, so that He become, he, he become a great interest and things on this earth becomes less and less interest. I come back from Philippines after 22 uh, months of silence, and I was just so grateful because when I landed in... Uh, Manila, I just think about this time last year, and I was sick last year. I was in no shape to do anything, but it just took me one year. Lord brought me back so that I could be used by Him in a small way, and I was just so thankful and grateful, right? That year, one year, was very, very difficult. I experienced so many things, but it was indispensable because it brought me to know who I am so that I may know who He is, so that I may know His mercy, so that I know 
Like everything that He does in my life and your life is not automatic. It's only by grace. Do you know that? Okay, do you know that? People say, I'm going to live up to 80 years old or 100 years old. How do you know? How in the world can you be so certain about that? What makes you so certain about that? It's not true. Your life is in the hand of God. He could take it away like this. I, I believe that. I also believe that my time will not be done until his time, time is up. But we need to humble ourselves. I need to humble myself. When I landed in Manila, I was just so thankful, rejoicing. Although it was like, I don't even know what the degree was. The humidity was over 100, I don't, I, you know, I'm sweating all day. Right? But it's okay. I was sleeping on a hard bed, felt like an altar. But that's, that's okay. That's nothing. But after one year of deadness, that I could be used by God in a small way, I'm just so thankful. I was just so thankful. Okay, brothers and sisters. Sanctification is that less and less things in the world interest you and greater and greater thing of God interests you. Is that happening in your life? Jesus said, sanctify them by the truth and your word is the truth. Okay? Don't grow old without sanctification. Okay? Purifying and giving yourself to God. Lastly, okay, last six verses, he pray for the unity of the church. Can I read this? Would you look at me? Uh, look, at, look at the front. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their words. That's you. That's the church. All believers in history. And he's now praying for the church. Okay? That they may all be, in, uh, all be one. Just as you, our Father, are in me, and I in you that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I in them, and you in me, that they, that, uh, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them even as you love me. I have made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Okay, it may sound very uh, repetitious, but basically he's praying for the unity of the church. Would you, uh, would, you, would you look at me, please? If you're not participating with the unity of the church, you're not really helping the church. Okay, if the church is moving, if you're standing still, it's not really helping. Jesus prayed that the church may become one. And the example of the unity of the church is triune God. Just as you are in me, Father, and I'm in you, and as we are one, may the church be one. You know why we need to be one? Because God is one. Okay? Through that, what happens? What is the outcome of the unity of the church? So that the world, world may believe Father has sent His Son. The gospel may be believed by the world when the church is one. Brothers and sisters, I'm pleading with you, okay? When we are one, the world will see God. When we are one, the world will see that God loves the world. When we are one, right? When we are one, the world will see God is real. So what can I do to promote and help unity of the church ought to be the question you should be asking if Christ is the Lord of your life. Do you agree? Would you say amen if you agree with me? Absolutely. Isn't that true? Okay. Let's say you have a full mem a member of family, father and the mother and a son and a daughter. Okay. If you do not participate in the unity of the church, what happens in the unity of the church ma mathematically? Okay, I know this is not something that we could calculate mathematically, but if there's a full member uh, family and you are one of them, right? If you don't participate, you go against what, what, what the family is trying to do. Mathematically, how does it work? 
75% of the people, try, uh, uh, members uh, of the family try, to, try for unity, but 25% is off. If we have a 100 member congregation, if you are turning against, turning your back against the church, against Christ, that much it'll be affected. And enemy will be saying, good job, good job, good job. But Christ is aching. Okay, Christ is aching. Okay. When the church is one, what happens? Not only the world will see that the gospel, but you will be filled with two things. Number one, it says, I have made known to them your name, and I'll continue to make it known that the love which you have loved me may be in them. Okay? When we are one, that's when the, the love of Christ is in us. You know, uh, this week when we were at uh, Mindoro, there are about 89 people there. Uh, that was 89 people, and it was eight of us, and then 81 uh, people from Philippines, including two missionaries. Okay, most of them are pastors and leaders. And you had to see, you saw the pictures, the joy in their faces. They were dancing like little babies. Okay, they don't normally do that. It's not. It's not normally like that. When the love of God and the grace of God reigning in the hearts and in, in the midst of the people, there is such joy and unity in the place. People were praying on the floors, crying and repenting. They were hurting and they were repenting. You saw that, but you really didn't see anything. You had to see what, was God, what God was doing. I will never know what God was doing because we, we, you know, how, how do you suppose to know by just looking at them out, outwardly? I can't. But God is doing so much more than what, seem, uh, you know, what I could observe with my naked eyes, but what you can hear through my testimonies, our testimonies. But when the joy of the Lord, uh, when the Spirit of the Lord was moving, the church became one, really one, you know? I didn't have to, you know, beg them to say amen. I, don't, I didn't really have to. They were so eager to say amen and to honor God. The love of God fills your heart when you are united with the love of Christ. And finally, I in them, the Christ may be in you. Christ may be in you when the church is united. Okay? I want to just summarize. Christ in me is the heart of Christ for us, okay? Christ in me is the heart of Christ for us. He's praying that Christ may be in you so that you will have the love of God in you, so that you will promote the unity of the church, so that this dying world may see hope through the church. How else would they see it? How else your unbelieving mother will see that God is alive unless we humble ourselves and become one? Okay? This is what Jesus prayed for. Glorify, sanctify, and unify. Is glory of God matter to you? I think about how these three things matters. When church is united, I think God gets glorified. Amen? When church is united, God gets glorified. When people are devoted and sanctified to Christ, God gets glorified. Because through our obedience. You know, I hope you, I hope, I hope you didn't hear this. Right? When church is united as one and loving one another, as they are sanctified for Christ, God gets glorified. They go hand in hand in hand. This is in the heart of Christ. This is in my heart as well. And I hope it is in your heart. Glory of God. Do you care about disciples? Jesus cared about it till death. Do you care about church? Jesus cared about it till death. Do you care about the glory of God? He cared about it to death. To death, he, uh, because for the glory of God, he gave his life. 
I just pray that you will know the heart of Christ. Okay, let's pray.